Okay, then welcome to my talk about mobile private contact discovery. So in this talk, I'm going to be going over what is this contact discovery process and some of the existing approaches that current uh, messaging applications are using. And then I'm going to be talking a little bit more about a cryptographic solution to this contact discovery process in the form of private set intersection. And for this private set intersection, I'd like to show you in a little bit more detail at a high level, different variants of private set in the section using oblivious pseudo random function, then how we can combine that with private information retrieval and also private set in the section using fully homomorphic encryption. At the end, a short outlook on what needs to improve even further for these technologies to be actually practical to be used in this way. So what is contact discovery? And contact discovery is the, the procedure that is executed when a new user signs up to a messaging service. If you want to join a messaging service, you also want to contact people you already know, most likely. And therefore, it might be a good idea to check which of the users on your local address book are also using this messaging service. And the way this usually works in many messengers is the client uploads a list of your local address book to the server. And then the server returns back the different uh, contacts that are also using the messaging service. And while this is fine and good, there might be some privacy concerns with this procedure. For example, there are many contacts that might be very sensitive and privacy critical to keep secret. If you think of journalists, for example, they might have in their local address book numbers of whistleblowers and inside sources. And if they install such a messaging app and these contacts get uploaded to a server, a malicious server could inspect all of the list of upload contacts and then build some social graphs from this information and see who is connected with whom, even if those people in question are not even using these messaging services themselves. Another concern is business contacts who have other uh, customer contacts in their uh, local address book. And these contacts then get uploaded also to this messaging services and might not be even clear if these business contacts are legally allowed to be uploaded to some third party services. So this, the standard messaging, uh, the standard mobile contact discovery procedures might have some privacy concerns that we maybe want to improve a bit. So let's have a look at the existing approaches of what is done today on trying to improve this. A very naive solution that many of you have probably thought of already is, okay, what if we just hash all of the contacts, all of the phone numbers and send the hashes of these phone numbers to the server instead? And this seems like a good solution since if we use a good cryptographic hash functions, these should have properties like pre-image resistance that the server cannot really get the phone numbers back of contacts he does not already know. However, there's a slight practical problem in that phone numbers actually do not ha have a lot of entropy. And for example, in the US, there's less than a billion valid phone numbers. So this is not a large amount for powerful servers, and they can easily brute force all of the possible phone numbers until they find the one that produced this hash. And you can easily use off-the-shelf tools for hash cracking, or even have some more powerful attacks and build rainbow tables to improve this even further. Even if you have a salt added to your hash, this does not have that much against targeted attacks. And in general, even if you use strong password hashing functions that slow down these hash cracking attempts, this is also not very helpful against targeted attacks against the single person, but also might reduce the overall user experience when they have to do this more expensive hash functions on their phone and also on the server side all the time. So another solution that's actually employed by Signal in practice is to essentially outsource the trust of this 
a contact discovery procedure to some trusted hardware. And here you can see the server now has this trusted uh, execution environment. And using this trusted execution environment, you can see uh, you can let the user verify that the code inside of this trusted execution environment is really only performing the contact discovery process and is not leaking any contacts that are not already known to the server outside of this trusted execution environment. However, trusted execution environments have been the target of a lot of attacks in recent years with uh, Plunderbolt, for example, an, exam uh, for an example attack or foreshadow trying to extract secrets out of these trusted execution environments. So these might pose some different considerations if you want to actually use the solution in practice. However, it is very performant and it is used by Signal. So in a 2019 paper uh, where myself and uh, Christian Rechberger, Thomas Schneider, Matthias Senke and Christian Weinert were involved, we performed a survey on the methods that currently uh, current messengers are using for this uh, mobile contact discovery process. And here we can see that half of some popular messengers that we surveyed do not even use this naive hashing procedure, but just upload the uh, contacts in the plane to their servers. And some of these messengers are using this naive hashing procedure, and one of them even was adding some salt. So what are the techniques that we can actually use maybe to improve on this situation? And there we go into this area of private set intersection. And private set intersection is really, as the name uh, tells you, it's an intersection of two sets, of two sets of items. And you want to compute the items in the intersection, but in a privacy preserving way. And for this, this specifically means that the other party, if you have these two parties with the respective sets A and B, they learn nothing about items outside of the intersection. So uh, we have many different scenarios for this private set intersection. There are very specific protocols that uh, are designed to uh, tailor to these scenarios. For example, we can think about the size of these sets. Are they both of equal size or is one set much smaller than the other one? Do we need security against semi-honest parties or uh, malicious parties? Can we leak the set sizes of the parties or is that also critical information? And we can also base all of these different protocols on different cryptographic building blocks. So generic multi-party computation, public key cryptography and oblivious transfer, most, uh, some of the most popular choices. If we look at private setness section for this mobile context discovery applications, then we can see that these popular messages uh, messengers, messaging services have millions, if not even billions of users. And a typical phone address book has around uh, 100 to 1000 contacts usually. And so this is a very prime example of this unbalanced PSI. And some have even called this application of mobile contact discovery the postal child of use cases for this unbalanced PSI. So uh, here's a short overview about this related work in this unbalanced PSI protocol scene. So we have some PSI protocols that are based on fully homomorphic encryption and some that are based on private, set and, uh, private information retrieval. We have these protocols that can be transformed in the pre-computation form and some that are based on oblivious pseudorandom functions with many different instantiations, for example, blind RSA, the now Rangold PRF garbage circuits and uh, blind modular exponentiation. And we have also some protocol based on other public key cryptography. Let's have a closer look at one category and this is this oblivious pseudorandom functions. And if we go back and think about this hash based solution, we see that it has one problem in that there's no secret information during the computation of this hash, so the server can easily brute force the hash once he gets it. And so one idea is what if we 
kind of encrypt the items instead of hashing them. But there's a slight caveat that we cannot give both parties the encryption key, since then this is essentially equal again to some hashing with a shared sort. And if we look at this uh, building block that we're going to be using, general encryption, or here as a pseudo and a function, we have some key k, and then we have an input item x, and these two get input into this pseudo random function, and then some item y falls out. And this is also deterministic. And what we actually want in our protocol is a slightly a different primitive, a related primitive that's an oblivious pseudo random function where we have a two party protocol where one party, here Alice on the left, inputs the secret key k and the other party on the right, Bob, inputs his item into this protocol and he gets the result. And importantly, Bob will never learn anything about this secret key k and Alice will never learn anything about the input item x. And this essentially allows us to give only one of the two parties the secret key and let the other party evaluate these items using this oblivious pseudo random function. So how can we build now a private set intersection protocol using these concepts of oblivious pseudo random functions? So here we have the basic protocol idea. We have some server set of items and some client set of items. And like in our contact discovery use case, the client set is much smaller than the server set. And here they share two common contacts, the green one and the blue one. And the basic protocol goes as follows. So the server picks a random secret key and encrypts all of its items with the secret key using the standard PRF construction. And then since this is now essentially random, if you don't know the key, he can send this set or some representation of this set of encrypted items to the client. Then the server and the client can engage in this oblivious pseudo random function protocol where the server inputs the key and the client inputs each of his items. And so the server and the client work together to evaluate this OPRF for each of the client's items. Then after this procedure is completed, the client now has two sets of encrypted items with the uh, encrypted with the same secret key. And since this is a deterministic procedure, he can now perform a standard intersection on these encrypted items. And because he kept track the client of which items, which plane items mapped to which OPRF evaluations, he can then figure out, okay, which of my items are in the intersection of the two sets based on the intersection of the encrypted items. And this is the, the basic idea behind this OPRF PSI protocols. So uh, in this tree, if you remember, there was this uh, pre-computation form of PSI protocols and uh, Kizadal explored to splitting these PSI protocols into three different phases, where in a setup phase, we do all of the expensive stuff that is related with the server contacts. So we encrypt all of the server contacts with a key K and insert them into a cuckoo filter. And the cuckoo filter is essentially a probabilistic uh, data structure where you can check for containment with some uh, specified false positive probability. And this uh, cuckoo filter allows for a very much more compact uh, representation than if you would just send the whole set of encrypted items to the client. And then we have the base phase where we have some input independent pre-processing if that is needed. So we can compute uh, correlated randomness. We can, for example, build garbage circuits. We can pre-compute oblivious transfers and then uh, store this information for a later point where we actually want to uh, evaluate our OPRF. And then in, this, in the third phase, in the online phase, we run this OPRF for all contacts and then the client checks if the result of this OPRF is contained in this cocoa filter. And 
the base phase and the online phase, they scale very nicely with the set of the smaller client set, uh, with the size of the smaller client set. So in our uh, paper, where we also did the survey, uh, we improved on uh, over previous work uh, in this category, where we added to this oblivious uh, pseudorandom function based PSI, uh, security against malicious receiver at negligible cost. And we also looked at two concrete instances where we have optimizations that result in a lower communication, where we, lose, where we use the low MC block cipher instead of IES for garbage circuits, and also use an elliptic curve version of the now Wrangler PRF. We also have some different uh, cuckoo filter parameters and a compression functionality that reduces the size of these cuckoo filters even more when sending them from the server to the client. Furthermore, we also uh, did a high performance uh, implementation using the native ARMv8 cryptographic extensions. And this results in a massive performance gain to previous work that only had uh, Java implementations, especially for garbage circuit evaluation on smartphones. And you can find the paper and our implementation at this link at contactdiscovery.github.io. So just to give you an idea on how expensive these protocols actually are, here we have the some times for the online and base phase for two different protocols from our work where the server set size is a quarter billion items and we have uh, the client set size be either one or 1,000. And uh, you can see that the times both for Wi-Fi and LTE connections are in the single digit seconds, which is pretty good. And also the communication is in the low megabytes. So this online and base phase are very fast and scale with the size of the client items. But the downside, of course, of these protocols is that there's this large one-time setup transfer where you need to transfer the representation of this server items be it a cuckoo filter or something similar to the client in some way. And this, of course, this communication scales with the set of the server size. For example, for our parameters of two to the 28 server contacts, the size of the initial cuckoo filter for transfer is about one gigabyte, which is, of course, not very practical if you think about installing a new messaging application and trying to uh, find your contacts. However, if you scale it down a bit and think about a million contacts, then this cuckoo filter goes down to four megabytes and this is already pretty doable for most applications. So let's have a quick look at some of the ideas to try to reduce this large one-time transfer and improve it a little bit. So one a quick idea would be to do some database sharding and essentially split the server contacts into some shards based on some criteria. And then the client only retrieves the small shards he actually needs to compare to. One idea would be to split it into region-based shards where you have some smaller databases for each country, for example. But this again can leak a lot of information. For example, if you have a single contact in a different country, then you also need to download that country's uh, database. And then you leak to the server that you actually know someone in this region, which can be uh, privacy critical. Also, another idea is to not split these shards into uh, region-based shards, but just essentially random shards, for example, based on the hash prefix of the phone number. And this reduces the impact of these privacy leaks from what database you actually download. But this again, then reduces the efficiency of the sharding since you then need to download many different shards since they are essentially random. Another idea to improve this process is to use another cryptographic primitive called private information retrieval. And private information retrieval is again, a very descriptive descriptive name, you want to retrieve an item from the database, but importantly, without revealing to the server holding the database, which item was accessed. 
So you can kind of think of it as sending some form of encrypted I, uh, index. The database then does some computation and sends you back some form of encrypted item without ever knowing which of the items was sent back. And we can use this private information retrieval to improve the efficiency of this lookup of the OPRF result. So there are very efficient multi-server private information retrieval protocols, and we can use them to improve the efficiency of the overall protocol. So first in the setup phase where the server would normally transfer the cuckoo filter to the client, we now do not transfer it to the client, but instead transfer the cuckoo filter as a one-time cost to some second server. Then the client and the server engage in their OPRF evaluations. And uh, after the client has the OPRF evaluations of all of his items, then he performs a multi-server private information retrieval to look up this item in the cuckoo filter. And these multi-server private information retrieval protocols have actually very efficient constructions and can bring down the total communication of the protocol to uh, a factor of the size of the client, since you, the client set, since you still need to perform the OPRF evaluations. But now uh, you do not need to send something that is linear in the server set size, but rather logarithmic. However, these multi-server private information retrieval protocols have one big downside, and that is that they have a so-called non-collusion assumption that is represented by this big red line in the middle. These servers are not allowed to talk to each other in any way. And if you would combine the information they get during the execution of these multi-server private information retrieval protocols, they can actually recover what item you accessed and then the whole security falls back down to a hashing-based solution. So this is a very unnatural security assumption for practical deployment, since a company that is hosting a big messaging service will probably not want to outsource something like this cuckoo filter of all their encrypted contacts to some external entity that they guarantee will not collude with them. Let's have a look at another way to do this private information at uh, this private set intersection, and that is using fully homomorphic encryption. So fully homomorphic encryption is a very nice uh, cryptographic primitive that essentially allows us to perform operations on encrypted data. And here in this picture, you can see a very popular analogy of this fully homomorphic encryption process where we have some party Alice who has some valuable piece of data. Here, this is this raw diamond and she does not have the capabilities to process this herself so what she does is she locks this diamond into a box and this represents the encryption process and sends this box over to bob who is an expert in processing this diamond and bob then can use the capabilities of this fully homomorphic encryption which is here depicted via this access through a glove box to process the encrypted data inside. So he cuts the diamond without ever being able to remove the diamond from the box, which is essentially stealing the data, getting the data out of the encryption. After he's done, he can send the box back to Alice and she can unlock it and get her processed result back. So how can we actually use this fully homomorphic encryption to also do private set intersection? And I'm again trying to show you this very basic idea behind the, a simple protocol where we again have some client with an item Y and a server with four items. So what the client does, he actually encrypts his item using this fully homomorphic encryption and then sends it to the server. And the server does the following. So for each of his items, he subtracts using the capabilities of this fully homomorphic encryption that you can operate on the encrypted data. He subtracts each of his items from the client item. So y minus x1, y minus x2, and so forth and so forth. And if you think about it, very importantly, if this client item y is equal to some of the server, uh, to one of the server items, 
this subtraction will equal zero. And this is important since now the server, again using the capabilities of this fully homomorphic encryption, performs a masked product where he multiplies all of these intermediate results together and also at the end adds this random mask. He then sends this back to the client and the client can decrypt it. And if you look at the computations that are performed, this result set here will equal to zero if the item Y was in the server set. And otherwise it will be random since if Y is not equal to one of these X's, none of these results here will equal zero. And then at the end, we blind this product of non-zero values with some random value. So it will be completely random. And this is the basic idea behind these protocols that I use fully homomorphic encryption to check if the client items are contained in the server set. And of course, there's only the very basics of these protocols and there are lots of additional optimizations. For example, using single instruction multiple data operations for homomorphic encryptions where you can pack thousands of items into a single ciphertext. They are using cuckoo hashing to reduce the sizes of the sets and split it into smaller sub protocols. And also there's some optimizations on, uh, again, using an oblivious pseudo random function as a pre-processing step to remove any information that might leak during the protocols from the items that are compared. And this protocol is a very nice feature that its communication complexity of the overall protocol is just linear in the size of the client items. Because if you go back and look at the protocol, you see that the client sends one encrypted item to the server who does all of the computation and sends one encrypted item back. This is very nice and we do not need any of these large offline transfers. However, the computational complexity is dominated by the size of the server set since you need to perform encryptions, uh, since you need to perform some uh, operations for each of the server items. And these are very expensive comparatively. So these are fully homomorphic encryption operations and multiplication of ciphertexts. And these are very expensive compared to plain operations. So as a comparison, so here again, we have the server set size of two to the 28 items and a client set size of 1000 items. And you can see that we have an offline phase that takes over an hour with 32 threads, but this is okay since this is a one-time cost, but still the, the online cost of these protocols uh, is about 12 seconds, but with a 32 threaded, uh, multi-threaded implementation. So you spend over five uh, core minutes essentially performing this single contact discovery process with a communication that is also about 18 megabytes. So while this is very good in terms of communication, still the, the latency of these protocols are not at practical levels yet. So let's uh, have a short conclusion and some outlook on what is happening or what needs to happen in the future. So essentially to really facilitate the practical deployment of these unbalanced PSI protocols for this mobile contact discovery use case, we need more efficient protocols. And private set intersection is a highly active research topic with new papers at top tier conferences each year. But most papers focus on the general case where you have balanced set sizes. And while there are very efficient protocols for these use cases, they are not the best uh, most of the times if you switch to unbalanced set sizes. If you have a look at the solutions that I presented in a little bit more detail, the OPRF based solutions, they need some improvement in their offline phase where you have either some protocol improvements that uh, remove the need to send some representation of the server set to the client or some uh, algorithmic improvements in the area of these private information retrieval protocols, which can also help to overcome this. For the fully homomorphic based solutions, the biggest step is that we need faster fully homomorphic encryption schemes that 
again, reduce the time it takes to perform these private contact discovery steps. And as a goal for practical deployment of such a solution, we got some quotes from uh, Signal that these protocols should support uh, some server database, which is more than a billion users and a client address book that has about 10,000 items. The latency of the whole protocol should be less than two seconds to facilitate a smooth user experience. And also the communication should be less than 10 megabytes also to uh, facilitate this smooth experience since we often do this on mobile connections. So both of these solutions are a little ways away from such uh, practical deployment numbers, but we are getting pretty close. And then we uh, also need to consider the limitations of private set intersection. And even a perfectly secure and efficient private set intersection protocol cannot protect against all attacks. For example, there are enumeration attacks we can try to find out which numbers are registered with the service by just trying out many, many different thousands of numbers during this contact discovery process. And a basic countermeasure that many of these uh, messaging apps are already implementing for this is just rate limiting because a valid normal user will not gain a thousand new contacts per day that need to be checked during this process. Another Concern is that these contact discovery APIs, even if they're implemented in a perfectly secure way, can still leak a lot of metadata. And some existing solutions actually send a lot of additional information during this contact discovery process. And here I'd like to advertise a brand new paper by uh, involving some of my colleagues from uh, TU Darmstadt that uh, was just made public yesterday and is concerning attacks on existing contact discovery APIs, but they take a look, closer look at the APIs of WhatsApp, Signal, and Telegram, and for example, perform crawling attacks that enumerate 100% of valid US telephone numbers for uh, the Signal contact discovery API and gain some nice statistics from that. So if you're interested in that, also have a look at this web page. Okay, and uh, with that, I'm done with my presentation. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.